then it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you online and here in the room for the today's start of our winter semester CCNB seminar series. Um, and today is a bit special for me for the introduction because I feel a lot of pressure, I have to say, in the introduction. As uh, Micha, as Micha Gerbler, our today's speaker, and we were talking this week about how you can make such an introduction like appropriately passionate so that everybody's like excited and happy to be here. So like I feel all this pressure on my shoulders to like uh, improve on this and give like a proper introduction uh, to Micha. Uh, where I would like to start that first of course it's like a great pleasure to have uh, Micha here who also uh, joined us recently in uh, teaching in our master program here at CFU and uh, maybe a short overview over um, his uh, CV. So Micha um, started initially studying with a bachelor in cognitive science in Osnabrück, which is also something that uh, connects us. It uh, was also like uh, in this uh, bachelor program at some time. Uh, then he did a dual master's in uh, brain and mind sciences in, at uh, UCL and uh, Paris. Then I like in your CV that you're listing that you had a year of traveling. Um, I think a, a good thing and good experience to do, to then uh, start with a, a PhD at uh, the Humboldt uh, University and uh, Charité, uh, to then afterwards uh, move to the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences in Leipzig, uh, where you uh, continued with different uh, positions so that uh, since now 2018, uh, Micha is group leader of the Mind, Body, Emotion group, and even so, it is a group that belongs to the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig. Uh, Micha and most of his uh, research is happening here, very close by, um, at uh, the Max Planck Institute, uh, located around the corner. Now, let me shortly check. Somebody's microphone is still open, but I just mute you. Uh, so, uh, that it is my uh, great pleasure to welcome you here uh, today, Micha, and I'm very much looking forward uh, to your talk, where I have to say, um, or like I have to, to, to admit that um, until quite recently or quite some years ago, I was not such a fan of uh, research, which is trying to investigate the mind-body interactions. And I just like saw in conferences, people were starting to, you know, measure pulse and then giving stimuli at different phases of like um, the uh, cardiac cycle. And I was really thinking like, well, this is like now really people are trying to correlate everything with everything. And it's just like fashionable to say, well, there's like our, our mind needs the body and there needs to be an interaction between mind and body. And then people just like, you know, put all into the same line and something will come out. And this is all pseudo correlations and it's all like um, type one errors that is reported in the literature. And I was convinced about this for quite some time and I was also ignorant against appropriate reading the literature mm -hmm. uh, where I now after many years and this uh, is established methodology and there's uh, good articles and uh, i have to say particularly due to that i know that uh, you are a, a very uh, smart thinker and critical thinker are still following this track that this gave me confidence that there is really something to this research and it's also worth reading it so that today with all humbleness uh, i have to say today i think uh, yes it's true there is something to it and it's even interesting so even more, I'm like very excited to hear your talk today, where research in this direction is going and what is today's knowledge about the interaction of the heart and the brain in your talk on neuroscience beyond the brain, linking heart-brain interactions to perception, action, and emotion. And uh, very happy to have you here, Micha, and the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Timo. <laughs> Super well done. So in, in all transparency, we spoke about it because I mentioned how I personally suck at introducing people appropriately. And I think so I felt very, uh, I feel very flattered and I'm uh, super happy to be here and to present our work on uh, these pseudo correlations and type one errors and that are representing on the next couple of slides. And I will actually start from where this came from. Um, very personally. So I started my PhD in uh, 2010 at uh, Charité and Humboldt University, and we invited social anxiety disorder patients 
who were severely um, impaired and we showed them emotional faces while they were lying in the scanner and we measured their fMRI. Um, then we also invited the same number of healthy controls and we compared the brain activity because we thought, of course, such a complex disorder like social anxiety disorder should have some representation in the brain or some uh, kind of correlation in the brain. Um, and what we found was no significant group differences. And so these non-significant group differences were puzzling. Um, and luckily at the same time, we had also attached these uh, kind of pulse clips and for sheer, I mean, for sheer exploration, so to say, we looked at the uh, cardiac responses to these faces. Um, and what we found was a significant interaction effect. So you don't need to look at the details of this. The main point is that there's a group difference uh, or kind of a group stimulus uh, interaction that became significant and that kind of raised my interest in the rest of the body. Um, so all of you know, there's the brain, there's uh, some other organs attached to it. Um, all of these organs have uh, rhythms and what I'm trying to uh, present today or what, what I did since then, so since for the past 10 years or so, is to focus on the heart and the brain to, to try to understand the, the connection between these two better. So the, what's on today's menu, I will first start with the heart alone, uh, then present uh, the one direction from the brain to heart, and then from the heart to brain. Ob obviously, this is an artificial separation because both organs are continuously interacting with each other, but just for the sake of simplicity and also for uh, methodological restrictions, I will disentangle these two, two directions before then um, I will present uh, also analyses where we try to integrate both signals at the same time. So this is probably high school knowledge. The heart is, this is how the heart looks like. It is, has about the size of a clenched fist and um, it's activated or the muscles are activated through a depolarization uh, of the, the heart muscles that then lead to the heart muscles to contract and to eject and to eject the blood into the um, circulatory system. Um, when the heart muscles relaxes or the heart muscle relaxes, then the blood flows back into the um, heart, into the different chambers, uh, so that this electric, that's why I call it the electric pump, that's why these electric signals are also tightly linked to the uh, flow of blood. Of course, it's much more complex and if you connect everything together, it looks a bit more like this. Um, here you see these different traces of, of uh, um, signals that you can uh, record. I hope that, the, by the way, these WebEx are okay, fluidly uh, illustrated. To simplify, just for the sake also of our analysis, to simplify this, on the one hand, these uh, pressure changes or pressure fluctuations. I'm not sure, do you see actually my, my mouse cursor here maybe? I don't know. I hope that you see it, but you see the right, I will, I will describe it, the, the red curve uh, shows these fluctuations that I just presented, namely the contraction of the heart muscles and the relaxation of the heart muscles. These pressure changes you can, for example, measure with a pulse clip or also with other optical um, methodologies. And then you see the electrical trace or the electrocardiographic trace rather here in blue that uh, is represented by this very famous signature of the QRS complex with the R peak um, uh, depicting a heartbeat and the beginning of the contraction of the heart muscles. This can be measured by attaching electro electrodes to the chest or to other body parts, either in a kind of more wired fashion, but also in these commercial devices, which we also use, and I will present a couple of studies with that. So physiologically, um, this, this brain to heart uh, interaction I will present in a second, but what we use to measure it is so the heart rate variability. So um, as you know, the, the heart, now about the uh, and control of the heart. The heart is innervated by both branches of the autonomic nervous system, just like all organs, almost all organs, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Um, here in the textbooks, it always looks like this innervation originates in the brainstem, which, are, which is obviously true, but also uh, actually includes the, the remainder of the, the brain, so higher cortical regions, for example. Now, the tricky, this is a tricky slide or important slide, because it shows the, the essence of the heart rate variability analysis, namely that through different physiological pathways, the time scale of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic uh, influences are different. And that means that the sympathetic activity, which increases the heart rate, can do so only very slowly. 
whereas the parasympathetic influences, which decrease the heart rate, can do that very fast at the scale of milliseconds. Now, unfortunately, um, the, these two branches, they don't work like a seesaw, so that one, if one goes up, the other goes down, or vice versa, but uh, they actually change and they are nonlinearly uh, associated. So that my metaphor that I like to use is that it, the sympathetic nervous system is kind of the speed um, pedal, um, accelerating the heartbeat, um, whereas the parasympathetic is the brake pedal, and whereas the sympathetic sort of foot on the speed pedal is a very slow foot, the, all the regulation, the fine-grained regulation of the car's speed, or the body speed, so to say, cardiovascular speed, is done by fine-grained tuning of the brake pedal. And this then brings us the advantage that if we look at these beat-to-beat -beat changes in the interbeat interval, so between consecutive heartbeats, um, we can analyze the higher frequency and lower frequency changes by inferring, for example, with a Fourier transform, by inferring that um, the lower frequency changes are driven by both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system, whereas the higher ones here depicted in yellow, so between, for example, 0.04 and 0.4 hertz, are exclusively driven by parasympathetic influences on the heart. And that allows us to, to really extract these uh, the parasympathetic or vagus nerve driven cardiac uh, regulatory uh, influences. So again, as a little summary, and these two measures that you will be seeing in my uh, slides is, if you look at these quick changes between consecutive heartbeats, and you can calculate in the time domain the so-called uh, RMSSD or root mean square of successive differences, um, you can extract the parasympathetic influences on the heart and that also works in the frequency domain as so-called high frequency or HF heart rate variability um, measures. So physiologically, it's relatively clear where these quick changes in the heart rate come from, but psychologically, they remain unclear. And there, one more important point is that these can be measured both at rest and at task. So at rest, when people, when you ask them to, when you don't, explicitly uh, give them a task or stimulate them. This would be a more kind of a trade measure for uh, heart rate variability or resting heart rate variability, whereas it's also possible to look at it time resolved to see um, how stimuli or task influences these uh, cardio regulations. And now um, what I did is, so I found these uh, effects in my PhD in the kind of for these emotional phases and I wanted to further understand other or test other scenarios, or other paradigms um, that influence heart rate variability. So one very straightforward one is psychosocial stress or stress. And it had been shown that work and emotional stress um, are influenced, influence um, uh, heart rate variability. And what we did is uh, in, in the PhDs by uh, Janis Reinhardt and Marie Ulich, uh, we had an extended stress induction where people came, they were lying in the scanner, then half of the participants were stressed with the so-called trio social stress test, which is a very established psychosocial stressor in which participants have to give an impromptu fake job interview to apply for their dream job in front of an authoritative audience or committee rather, whereas the control group uh, also had to get up and talk, but in a, without being psychosocially evaluated. And what we found with this portable chest, chest strap is that over the course, so uh, I hope that you can see my mouse. If not, then because of that during the stress, kind of this is now overlaying the sequence of events that at baseline, both groups, when this baseline correct data, both groups were similar. And then the stress group here depicted in red showed a much steeper decline in uh, heart rate variability than the control group, and then also took longer to recover and we found a, a highly significant time by group interaction. So this was all males. And we followed up on that kind of that in acute stress, we followed up on that in acute stress, in um, stresses in everyday life. And this was an MD thesis by Anne Rona that was unpublished, actually completed at the FU. Uh, FU. And there we had uh, in the lab, we asked participants to undergo a resting HRV uh, measurement, and then we gave them smartphones and a portable chest strap for five days. 
And uh, without wanting to go into all the details, because it's more kind of, of an overview of different uh, heart brain studies that I'm going to present, is that we found we kind of recorded the stressors in everyday life while also extracting the heart rate variability uh, through these portable chest straps. And we found a similar uh, decrease in heart rate variability due to stress in the males, here depicted in blue, but we did not find um, such a decrease in the females. Quite opposite, we found even a, an increase in, in heart rate variability and a significant interaction effect. Then kind of this part you already knew, kind of we had these phases, there was a um, kind of uh, an increase. I actually don't want to go, I want to save some time for, for this study because we, you already saw it and it's quite old. Then uh, we had another, uh, we ran another study uh, with Anne Schrimpf where we used the cyberball paradigm. So it's yet another socio-emotional tasks in which participants um, um, are playing a ball game with fake confederates. So um, they're led to believe that there are two other participants in the room and then they can decide where they want to throw the ball to. And then unbeknownst to them, of course, the Confederates are uh, not real people, but they, um, they're pre-programmed. And so in the second part of the experiment, after a normally balanced uh, throwing the ball back and forth, they are uh, excluded from the ball game so that it leads to a kind of an ex, uh, exclusion, a social exclusion uh, scenario. And what we found there was that um, um, there was an uh, effect for uh, obese women, particularly there's also, again, I don't want to go into the details here. It's more kind of an overview um, that the manipulation was also the obesity and the leanness of the Confederates. And we found that there was a, a, a significant heart rate variability effect for the uh, obese women that was also linked to the negativity of their um, body view of their own kind of uh, view of how they perceived their body to be. Now, this was kind of all these aspects about task based uh, heart rate variability variations. There's a, a strong caveat that was, was already, always impl already implicit in what Timo said earlier, namely that looking at only this one dimensional heart rate variability uh, measure and looking at these millisecond based variations in uh, the, the heart reactivity only allows a very small glimpse, obviously, because they, this can be associated and we, then this, this can be associated with so many psychological aspects that it's hard to uh, extract specificity in, in that. And so now what I want to present is um, an association, so kind of to, to bracket the task based heart rate variability aspects for a moment and to look at resting heart rate variability and its association to the brain. And so what we did in with Dennis, with Dennis Kumral, sorry, was that we took participants resting heart rate variability during uh, non stimulation and non task because the resting heart rate variability has been uh, associated with clinical markers of disease, for example, of um, also morbidity and mortality. And in psychology, beyond these socio-emotional phenomena that I presented in our studies, it has also been associated with executive function, self-control, and cognition. Again, in resting state measures, so that people looked at task performance and the resting state heart rate variability and then associated these uh, two measures. And this, by the way, as a side remark that we can, I'm happy to discuss also, there might uh, super well be a lot of uh, kind of false positives uh, in such associations. So now we wanted to look at resting heart rate variability and the resting brain. So we took data that we already had in uh, two big data sets and we looked uh, at 388 participants in total. They were all healthy and uh, distributed in three different age bins. And what we looked at in the, in the ECG was we took the clinically recorded 10 second ECG um, and the three Tesla resting state fMRI we analyzed the uh, uh, root mean square of successive differences that I presented before. So this, this time parasympathetic card cardioregulation at rest. And then we looked at the uh, structural MRI in terms of voxel-based morphometry. So we wanted to look at structural brain uh, changes associated with resting heart rate variability. 
And for the fMRI, uh, we looked at eigenvector centrality mapping, which, if you're not familiar with it, is a graph-based measure that allows a non-parcellated a non um, uh, analysis of the functional architecture of the brain. Sorry, my screen just got dark, and I wonder if my electricity is dying. Uh, apparently not. And so uh, what we did is we, we um, associated these so maybe the eigenvector centrality, just one second. So you consider each voxel as one node of this big network. And then you look at the connectivity profiles of each voxel and you weigh them by the prominence of the other voxels. So how the example is always uh, a nice intuitive example is um, the airport. So for example, if you take Leipzig airport and Leipzig, Air Leipzig airport has a thousand connections to Midweida airport, to Cottbus airport, to and Lutherstadt Wittenberg Airport, which themselves have only maybe two connections, then uh, this is weighted differently than, for example, London Heathrow Airport, um, that has uh, also a thousand connections, but is connected to Charles de Gaulle Airport, which has a thousand connections, and Berlin Airport, which has a thousand connections, and so on. And so the nice thing about it is that you don't need a region of interest or some other parcellation of the brain to look at the connectivity profiles of the functional architect or the functional architecture of the resting brain. First of all, we found the uh, age related decline in resting heart rate variability that, that has been reported over and over. And then um, we associated this, these resting heart rate variability measures with the functional architecture of the brain. And we found one cluster in the uh, parietal midline that showed a positive association with resting heart rate variability across all three age groups. And then we found a cluster, a significant cluster in the frontal midline that showed an age specific um, association in that it was positively associated with resting heart rate variability in the young uh, age group and um, non-positively in the other age groups. And this corresponds quite well. These midline structures correspond quite well with uh, reports that, with previous reports of fMRI studies that have associated, for example, this um, parietal midline with parasympathetic activation, um, and also this frontier, frontal uh, midline with um, heart rate variability associated uh, activation changes. So that it can be interpreted in a very tentative fashion that at rest, uh, the brain maintains or attends to the body and particularly the parasympathetic activation. Um, and there's also this overlap between the so-called central autonomic network, so the set of brain regions um, that uh, is associated with these visceral or internal bodily processes. If you jump over that, then let's in the other direction. So in a nutshell, um, kind of from the brain to heart, we, use, we make use of heart rate variability in task-related uh, studies, we found associations to socio-emotional processes, and we have some evidence for brain-related functional con connectivity um, uh, links. Now, in the heart-to-brain direction, that's the um, approach of analysis that Timo mentioned, and I also want to uh, give us a small intro to the methodology. So again, there you remember this, this uh, activity of the heart. Um, with the pressure changes and the electrocardiographic signatures. Also, that uh, um, leads to, let me see, where is this from? <laughs> Sorry, here it is. Uh, it can also be kind of um, divided into the systole, so the phase when the cardiac muscle, muscle ejects the blood, and diastole when the cardiac muscle is relaxed and the blood flows back to the heart. Whenever the, the blood is ejected into the, the vessels, there are uh, small mechanoreceptors in the vessel walls and also in the heart walls, so-called baroreceptors, that become active with pressure changes. And that signal that send action potentials upstream, so to the brainstem, but also to other parts of the brain, to inform the brain about what's going on in the heart or rather in the blood pressure. So that the cardiac phase can be subdivided into two phases, so systole and diastole. And this little Wi-Fi symbol is supposed to indicate the activity of the baroreceptor in the schematic. So again, this is just the textbook. So the signals are sent upstream to the brainstem, um, but also um, from the brainstem, they're relayed to higher brain regions such as the amygdala and others. 
So these cardiac cycle effects in the history have been already reported in the, I think, 1920s, or even then it became bigger in the 1960s, where people presented, they had these light bulbs, and then they were switching on these light bulbs or presented tones, and then they showed, and people, participants had to press a button whenever they saw a light bulb, and then uh, people analyzed whether it made a difference, the reaction times differed, whether these light bulbs were switched on uh, during different phases of the cardiac cycle. So first it was equally distributed over the cardiac cycle into different bins, um, but then, uh, and there, there, there were some significant findings, but there was also non-significant findings. Then it would became silent for quite a, a long time. And then in the 1990s, it was reactivated. And there typically it was not analyzed in these individualized bins, but in uh, these two different phases of the cardiac cycle, these prominent phases of the cardiac cycle. And there it was shown, for example, that uh, low level reflexes and pain responses uh, were dampened in systole. But also, and this will become important later, that the perception of fear phases, for example, if of masked fear phases, that fear phases, when they were masked, were more likely to be detected when they were presented in systole compared to diastole. And they were also perceived as more intensely fearful when they were presented in systole compared to diastole. Yeah, that's the uh, graph from the respective paper, from the Garfinkel paper. So what we typically do, so we kind of build on that work. Mm, here's yet another schematic. So you have an event, be it a stimulus or so, you measure the ECG, and then you relate the presentation of this shortly presented stimulus uh, through the cardiac cycle, and then you either bin it into these uh, two cardiac phases, uh, or you can also analyze it continuously by using circular statistics, so you, you kind of then uh, um, related in the, to a continuous representation of the cardiac cycle, which um, happens between these two uh, R peaks in the ECG depicted here in these blue squares. And this is what we did for a paradigm that has been around uh, also with you, but also uh, in Arno's bigger environment, so to say, um, for a long time. And that is this paraliminal somatosensory stimulation, electrical finger nerve stimulation. In case you're not familiar with it, it looks like this. So you have these kind of two rings, or kind of one ring rather, or one, stimul one stimulator uh, attached to the index finger. And then there, the intensity is tuned individual, individually to each participant so that it's just at the verge of being detected. And so um, what we've been doing, and this was um, um, guest researcher Pavel Mutika who did that, is that we presented that to participants while also recording the ECG, and then we binned it uh, into these two cardiac phases, or in this case, sorry, uh, to be analyzed continuously. So here, just how, you, how to read these plots at the zero line, and so at 12 o'clock, so to say, it's the, the beginning, the onset of a heartbeat. And then each uh, arrow that you see is one participant. So this is the group level results. And we found that when a preliminary preliminary somatosensory stimulus is presented towards the end of the cardiac cycle, and this is, again, I don't know if you see my mouse, but this is on the left of the clocks, the bigger, the thicker arrow uh, is the end of a cardiac cycle because it's just before the next heartbeat, so to say, so that when the stimulus is presented it does make a difference where in the cardiac cycle you present this paradiminal stimulus because when it's presented towards the end of the cardiac cycle, it's more likely to be perceived. Whereas it's, if it's presented in the first third or towards the first third of the cardiac cycle, and this is the right clock, um, then it's more likely to be missed. So in, Ka in Pavel's study, this was a non-significant trend, but there was a, a rather clear dissociation. Then uh, Ezra, Ezra Al uh, also, confirmed these findings in a completely independent um, sample, but also with a slightly different setup. I, I'm not, I won't go into the details, but she found pretty much the similar results. And also in her case, the misses were significant. And in the meantime, it has been confirmed in two more independent studies. I think I might mention two of them. I might mention them in a, um, a bit later, but kind of these were definitely the most robust replications that I've had my hands on in my uh, scientific career. However, now um, 
perception is hardly ever passive. Um, and so we also wanted to look at active perception because there had been findings around that, for example, um, systole uh, is associated with a higher or more microsaccades occur in systole and microsaccades are these fixational eye movements um, that are involuntary. And in this uh, study by Ole et al, it had been found, so this is the kind of group level bump that uh, the amount of microsaccades is significantly increased towards systole. So again, this is the R peak at zero, at 12 o'clock it's the R peak. And so towards at the beginning of the cardiac cycle, there's a higher uh, occurrence of microsaccades. So these active adjustments of the gaze. And we wanted to go quite quickly, quite far. And we wanted to see whether this uh, active sampling um, is also a true at a very high level. And we devised the simplest experiment ever. Namely, participants had to push a button um, in order to reveal a photograph, which they were asked to, first of all, look at, but then also to memorize. And then later, uh, we ran a recognition test. So again, the simplest experiment is participants were seated. They were asked to push a button. Whenever they pushed a the button, they could see for 100 milliseconds a photograph, um, which then disappeared. And then they could push a button again to show the next photograph. And then there was a five minute break and half of the images were presented uh, again and half of the images were new and they had to say uh, whether an uh, image was old or new. Um, this was pre-registered with open data, by the way. And what we found is a similar bump for the button presses that as the one that was reported by Sven Ohl for the micro saccades, that is participants were more likely to reveal an image at the beginning of the cardiac cycle. This we also confirmed in binary analysis, but the graph is complex and I don't want to go into the details. Most importantly also, this, although there was this bias to reveal these images at the beginning of the cardiac cycle, this did not lead to a better memory performance against our hypothesis. So that um, there, the behavioral relevance of, these, of this bias to push a button uh, is still unclear. Also another uh, study that that we did on a cardiac cycle that, that goes into the more kind of applied a more naturalistic direction. And there we have to come back to this uh, previous finding by others that I presented before, namely that fearful faces or fearful stimuli, or fearful stimuli in this case, in the Garfinkel case, it was fearful faces are perceived as more intense um, during when they're presented during systole compared to diastole. And so in this project by Pavel Motika and Felix Klotsche, we built on that and we took another finding from psychology that, that um, was repeated a couple of times, namely that more fearful items or more threatening items are judged as being closer. So we wanted to take now the estimated closeness as a proxy for the intensity. We didn't want to ask participants how intense was it, but we took the um, perceived distance as a proxy for that. And what we did is we used uh, virtual reality. So these uh, virtual reality head mounted displays um, as a, a stimulation device for the spatial proximity. So you were placed in this corridor and then you, you were presented with either threatening or non-threatening animals. So this is a trial. I hope that the video gets across okay. So you would be seeing this, this animal and then you would uh, be asked to report where, how close it was to you. And the hypothesis uh, this is, by the way, how the setup looks like. So people, kind of in this case, Pavel wearing a head-mounted display uh, and is wired with an ECG. Here you see the little amplifier on the red chair behind him. And the hypothesis was that if um, uh, fearful stimuli are perceived as being more intense, more intense means as more closely to myself, then the perceived distance would be significantly decreased when the threatening animal was presented during systole. And this uh, was pre-registered and it's uh, not what we found. So we're currently still analyzing the data, but there was no uh, the significant interaction effect or this interaction effect did not become significant. And there uh, we're still analyzing the data. And I hope to then present you with uh, some results or at least update you when we publish the null findings. Now about the joint analysis of the heart and the brain. 
because for the moment we had this uh, heart to brain and brain to heart, but there's also this possibility of fusing both uh, time series in a more kind of straightforward fashion, namely the in a so-called heartbeat evoked potential. And this has been around for now 40 years or so. And so you record the ECG and the EEG at the same time. And instead of uh, locking the EEG trace to events from the stimulus or from the experimental uh, design, you lock them to events in the cardiac activity. So in this case to the R peak, and then you average over it. And so this is, for example, how it looks like. So this is in two different conditions. Um, you average the EEG trace over the R peak and then look at the amplitude or the waveform of these uh, heartbeat evoked potentials. And so in these studies that I presented before, I only presented the cardiac uh, aspects, but uh, in the somatosensory, uh, in the ESRA, or ESRA during her study, during her PhD also recorded EEG. And she also looked at the brain traces of uh, these effects that I, that I presented before. And she found, now this is not yet the heart, heartbeat evoked potential, but this is the sensory, uh, the somatosensory evoked potential. So the um, now locked to the events of the stimulation, so to say, not to the heartbeats yet, but to the uh, sensory stimulation. Remember the perilimnal stimulation at, at the left index finger. And she looked at the sens somatosensory evoked potential over C4, which is the contralateral somatosensory cortex, or at least the kind of in the vicinity at the sensor level. And then she looked at whether the sens somatosensory, or she found that the somatosensory evoked potential uh, differs for systole and diastole. Here, just as a little side remark, by the way, because systole is always significant or always substantially shorter than diastole. Um, she, we always took, take good care of uh, having uh, similar windows of similar length. And she found that there were significant differences in the amplitude of the somatosensory evoked potential. She also found significant differences in the heartbeat evoked potential, so locked to the heartbeat just before the stimulation. And she also found that these two are related, so that the heartbeat evoked potential and the somatosensory evoked potential uh, um, are linked, are significantly linked. Again, so this is the, this, by the way, is the replication. So she, I asked Martin, Martin Grund, oh, I don't have his picture, sorry. Martin Grund ran a study where he found um, similar, ah, sorry, sorry. So this is what Ezra found, sorry. This is what Ezra found during her PhD in the uh, Al et al paper that I mentioned earlier. She then replicated it herself in a fully independent sample, finding exactly the same uh, or very comparable uh, modulation of the uh, heartbeat evoked potential amplitude. And then also Martin ran an independent study again with a different, with a sli slightly different design, um, completely independent sample. And he also found similar uh, cardiac cycle related effects for somatosensory stimulation. As a reminder, a higher likelihood to detect a perilimnal somatosensory stimulus when it's presented towards the end of the cardiac cycle and um, a higher chance to miss it when it's presented at the beginning of the cardiac cycle or at the, uh, begin of the, at the end of the first third of the cardiac cycle. And also, ah, yes, this is the behavioral replication and then Ezra also found this uh, that's what I mentioned already, that she replicated very similar, or she found very sim similar HEP uh, amplitude differences between misses and hits. Now, another study on, so this is one way. So the kind of heartbeat evoked potential is one way to jointly analyze the ECG EEG. That's something we also did in a different context. I don't, so this, I briefly will introduce the study. Um, I don't need to tell you what alpha power is, presumably. So uh, it's an, it's a the first prominent uh, EEG rhythm that was reported. You can see it with the naked eye in the raw uh, EEG in the raw EEG trace, and it becomes more pronounced when the eyes are closed uh, compared to when the eyes are open. But also when the eyes are open and there's stimulation, it has been found that higher emotional arousal, so the intensity of an emotional experience is associated with lower parietal occipital alpha power and vice versa. So even when the eyes are open, um, 
Now, in this case, it was induced by pictures and music. The higher the emotional arousal, the lower the parietal occipital alpha. And this has been found in, in a couple of studies with uh, static uh, visual stimulation. And what we wanted to see is whether this also holds true during more dynamic, more naturalistic stimulation. So what we did, and this is the master thesis of these three guys, so Simon Hoffman, Alberto Mariola, and Felix Klotsche, we again used HD, uh, an immersive VR scenario, so with the HTC Vive and the 30-channel EEG. And participants underwent a VR experience that comprised emotion, uh, sorry, that comprised roller coasters because we wanted to induce variance in emotional arousal. We also, everybody saw the, uh, did the experience twice uh, with and without free head movement. And after the experience, because during the experience, we didn't want to interfere with the experience, but after the experience, we had them continuously rate the amount of emotional arousal that they experienced on a visual analog scale from one to 50, from zero to 50. Uh, I will show you a video in, in a second. So this is how it looked like. Um, on the top, you see the first person perspective. On the bottom, you see the third person perspective or the experimental view. And there also you see this uh, blue glowing knob uh, that was then used uh, after the experience when they were replayed what they saw before to continuously rate the amount of uh, emotional arousal, which was, which you see here uh, in the schematic to the right. And then what we did, it has nothing to do with the heart yet, but we did uh, is what, what we did is we analyzed, we tried, or we aimed, and we succeeded to decode the degree of emotional arousal from the EG, EEG trace during the experience. So as a reminder, this was the uh, what had been found before. This is taken from the paper by Luft and Bataharia that low arousal is associated with higher uh, alpha power and vice versa. And this is what we also looked at in our data in a more naturalistic stimulation. Um, this, in this case, by the way, it's during the uh, head motion condition. And we also find um, um, a similar uh, association so that the alpha power helps us or lets us decode the, uh, the low or high arousal um, in subjective emotional experience. And this was also predominantly over prior to occipital sensors. And so now what uh, Antonin Foucault is currently looking at, and he's uh, he also did the masters, the cognitive neuroscience masters, I think at a time when it was still called uh, scan master, and he's now doing a PhD with us. And he's looking, because we also analyzed, or we actually also recorded the ECG. And so now he's looking at the association of brain heart interactions uh, and emotional arousal. There he first found uh, kind of to closing the loop to back at the very beginning of my talk that higher emotional arousal is associated with lower high frequency heart rate variability, just as we would expect also from our previous findings on stress and so on. Um, and then he uh, analyzed also the heartbeat evoked potential. So in this Luft and Bataharia paper, they found not only that higher arousal uh, is associated with lower prior to occipital alpha power, but also um, with a differential HGP amplitude over this uh, uh, right um, parietal uh, sensor. And he found also an association or a difference rather in the HGP amplitude between the two arousal conditions, but he found it in the left, in a, in a left frontal cluster. Uh, at in sensor level and looking at um, the, the source level, we assume or we kind of we infer that it's actually the same under or a very similar underlying source and it's just a dipole that has flipped the sign. But it's something we still need to confirm. So this is super fresh uh, results out of uh, the not yet the press, but it's kind of they're currently being written up. Um, and also in something where we go, where we try to go beyond this time, these event-related, rather kind of condensing or limiting uh, analyses of the HEP, we're now also using more computationally demanding physiologically modeling, also kind of making use of this what I presented at the very beginning that the different uh, the different branches of, of the autonomic nervous system interact with the heart at different time scales. 
namely the sympathetic nervous system at the second level and the parasympathetic nervous system at the millisecond level. And now um, in, in more complex um, analysis methods, we are feeding in the different oscillatory phenomena at the brain level. So in the different kind of in these five fundamental um, frequency ranges from alpha to gamma, from delta to gamma, um, and also the, the heart rate variability in these two different time uh, frequencies, frequency ranges um, to infer um, information flow, also directed information flow between the brain and the heart. Um, so there, and these are super fresh uh, results. I would not call them preliminary anymore, but uh, still fresh is uh, that we find that high arousal periods and this is from the roller coaster data, uh, are associated with higher heart to brain interactions, information flow from high frequency heart rate variability to prior to occipital alpha, and um, lower brain to heart information flow. So, kind of extending our previous findings of a link between emotional arousal and prior to occipital alpha power. So, that in summary, um, the heart is a vital organ. Also, to also for the mind, something that I completely bracketed uh, is also respiration. There is some aspects of respiration because respiration is very closely linked to cardiac activity. But compared to cardiac activity, respiration is under our voluntary control. And so, for example, in the Martin Grund paper that was published this year. By the way, I will also send you the slides, and you can click on the links to be directed to the papers if you want to read up on them. And um, so, in the Martin Grund paper. There was, um, we also found that participants actually adapt their respiratory cycle to the time course of the experiment. So something that I bracketed for the moment is respiration, although it's closely linked. Uh, and, and the bigger picture is, of course, that not only brain-heart interactions, but also brain respiration, to some extent also brain-stomach uh, and other uh, um, bodily organs are informative or are important, uh, send important signals for the brain. Then in the brain to heart part, um, we linked task-based heart rate variability and socio-emotional processing. The pros I already said that kind of they, they can be nicely measured. The cons that it's only a one-dimensional inform kind of uh, physiological signal that can only go so far in, in, in uh, telling you about the psyche. Then in heart to brain, we make use of these natural fluctuations of the cardiac cycle and physiologically the, power, the kind of um, baroreceptor activation. And we find that it influences action and perception, of course, only one particular aspect of action. And we don't know yet the functional relevance of, for example, this bias to press a button at the beginning of systole. Also perception only very restricted to the somatosensory domain and even in the visual domain for the moment, we don't find in this, remember this uh, study with the animals, we don't find what has been found in these more highly controlled situations in the lab. So there's a lot uh, to be researched there. And in the heart-brain coupling, and that's the most um, fresh data, we do find these links between f of um, heartbeat evoked potentials and emotional arousal. And now we're using these more fine-grained, uh, also directed, uh, but also as more as assumption-loaded uh, modeling approaches to, to get a better grasp of heart-brain coupling. And with that, I want to thank all those amazing folks that were involved in um, these studies, and uh, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm very much looking forward to discussing our uh, false positives.